All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us again to the NSLS2 lectures. Uh, today's uh, lecture is Dr. Um, Xiaojing Huang. And uh, Dr. Huang, it's all, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sal. Hello, everyone. This is Xiaojing. Um, I'm a physicist from the National Synchrotron Light Source 2. And today is my great pleasure to uh, discuss with you guys uh, some um, uh, details about X-ray microscopy. Um, um, since it's a microscopy method, the whole idea is about the visualization and uh, how to create, how to define and how to create a good image. Um, I guess um, I don't need to emphasize too much that uh, visualization is very important to, to us, to everyone. And it's a study shows that about two thirds of the brain cortex is involved in functionalities related to vision. And I think to some extent we can, everybody can claim we are expert on visualization since we are using our eyes to look around the world and we use in, in our daily life, we use cameras or uh, uh, cell phones to take, take pictures. We are. This is. We are very familiar to this to the uh, realization process. Um, so now, but uh, let's let's ask you a, a question. What's a good image? Now I give you two examples. Let's look at the two images on the top row first, uh, and then for this example, maybe maybe it's relatively easy to tell. Like the image on the left side is better than the image on the right side because the right side one is very and uh, most uh, details, detailed features. So now let's move, let's look at the, the two pictures on the bottom row and then ask the same question again, which image is better? And this time you may need to think twice. It really depends what, what uh, um, are you looking for? So um, this simple um, uh, uh, example is kind of, uh, give us a hint, like although we are so familiar about uh, uh, visualization, but there may be some um, details uh, worthwhile to be discussed. And that's what we want to do today. And of course, uh, now today's topic is about X-ray microscopy. That means we uh, use X-rays for visualization. And then the first question we ask is why we want to use X-rays. And as we know, X-ray is just one uh, type of uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, waves. And uh, the, 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 the X-rays has relatively a high energy and uh, uh, the uh, corresponding wavelength is relatively short. So, so it's like you have a suite of tools and then depends on what, what object you are looking for, what resolution you are targeting, you choose different uh, wavelengths uh, to for the uh, visualization purpose. So uh, let's look at the picture on the right side. This gives you a rough idea uh, of the pick up the correct tool for your uh, for your uh, purpose. So like <clears throat> on the on the top of the image for our daily life, uh, we if we want to see what you like find our cell phones, look at the flowers or the nature um, nature beauties. Our human eye usually is good enough for this kind of observation. And then if we uh, uh, want to look at smaller features like the hair, the human hair, and then probably now we need help from a magnifier. And then if we keep going down, if we want to look uh, even smaller stuff like cells, and then and, and now probably we need to uh, uh, use a uh, uh, light microscope and then if we keep moving down, if we're looking at stuff, uh, objects smaller than uh, one micron and to like uh, 100 or 10 uh, nanometers to this scale, that's the regime for X-ray microscope, microscopes. And of course, we can uh, keep going down to, you know, to achieve uh, atomic resolution. Then that's the regime for uh, electron microscope. So, the regime for X-ray microscopy is like from like a few micron 
to uh, tens of nanometers. That's the uh, target uh, resolution area. We are, um, it's good for X-ray imaging. And there's another uh, 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 reason we want to work with X-rays is like, as we know, X-ray has very powerful uh, penetration um, ability. So we can, with X-ray, we can uh, study very uh, thick materials. Okay, and then um, the the brightness, the order intensity, the brightness of the X-ray sources really uh, took off after the uh, synchrotron radiation phenomenon was discovered. And on the, the the chart on the left side, we can see the brightness really in increased uh, exp exponentially uh, along the line. And these days, the third generation uh, synchrotron um, facility it's very, very popular and it's, it has been built um, in a lot of countries around the world. And recently, the fourth generation uh, uh, radiation store, that's the, uh, called uh, uh, free electron lasers. They are, um, they're, they're, they are just uh, emerging and uh, new facilities are building. Uh, a few uh, facilities already functional and uh, more is coming out soon. And uh, on the journey to increase the uh, uh, the X-ray uh, brightness, and then in the same time, the coherence property of the uh, X the generated X-rays also uh, improved significantly. Uh, let's uh, let's take a little time to uh, look at what what the coherent property of the light. I think in our daily life, we the most light source we use is uh, incoherent. Uh, we call it incoherent uh, in two folds. The one, first one is that they, the light goes to all different directions. They are not uh, um, uh, collimated. This is called uh, spatially incoherent. And then and this, uh, the second fold is like the, um, the light from, for example, from the light bulbs, they are not uh, a single color. They contain uh, a, a rather uh, wide bandwidth of colors. So, and this is because it has different colors, it's called a, a temporarily incoherent. So, okay, so now let's say if we start with incoherent uh, light source, how can we create a coherent light illumination? So we can, uh, the easiest way is we apply two theaters. The first one is a special coherent theater. Essentially it's a small pinhole. You put a pinhole in, in front of the light source and then you can uh, see the, um, uh, the uh, wave front coming out from the pinhole. It, it's like they are, um, they are, uh, uh, the, the, the propagation condition is finalized and everybody after the pinhole is like, they, they're pointing to the same direction. And, uh, and we can say that they are uh, spatially coherent. And then uh, uh, for the temporal coherence, we can put a, uh, a uh, um, uh, color theater in front of the source, and that only allow a, a specific uh, light uh, with uh, with certain uh, wavelengths to pass through, and the, uh, all other lights, all other colors will be blocked. So you can imagine we can put one pinhole and one color theater in front of the uh, incoherent source, and then we're going to generate uh, uh, coherent. Uh, illumination afterwards with single color and with the uh, propagation direction uh, collimated. And the uh, uh, pictures on the right side gives us a rough idea how to how we determine the uh, coherence lens in both uh, spatial and the temporal uh, 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 regime. So the top the top left the top right picture shows like shows us like. Let's say, uh, assume we have a pinhole with a diameter of D, and then if we trace the light uh, from the uh, two boundaries of this pinhole, so of this uh, pinhole, yes. And then let's trace the light and then the go to a um, um, point, the same point on the screen downstream. And then we can see the light, the lights come from these two points. They, they will have a, a path difference. And when this path difference equals uh, half of the wavelength of the of the uh, instant illumination, 
the just two waves will uh will um exactly uh in opposite phase when they reach this point then they will cancel out each other and that's the that's the um criterion we use to define the the coherence lens on the on the uh, target screen and uh, it's uh, proportional to the wavelength the distance and the size of the the pinhole and as you can see um one trick to if if we really want to uh, increase the coherence length, uh, one trick is to uh, reduce the uh, re reduce the thing hole size, and or we you move your uh, target plane further away. But in either method, you will see the the um, uh, resulting uh, photon flux on your observation screen uh, plane will be decreased. Okay, the, uh, the right button image shows like the uh, temporal incoherence case. So let's say in the illumination, we have two wavelengths. One, with, uh, uh, one is lambda, another one is lambda plus delta lambda. And then if we let these two waves propagate to a certain distance, and you can see because the wavelength is uh, slightly different, and then there, there will be off sync again. And, if, and then at a certain distance, they will off sync uh, exactly uh, by uh, 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 the half period. And then at this point, these two waves start to cancel out each other again. And then this distance is, we use this criterion to define the um, longitudinal, uh, the temporal coherence lens, or we call it a longitudinal coherence lens. And it's determined by the lambda and the bandwidth of the illumination. Okay, now let's see. Uh, let's give a uh, briefly see what's the difference between coherent and incoherent illuminations. And in, for this purpose, we can ex express the vibration of the wave as a complex uh, uh, variable. The A stands for the uh, vibration magnitude, and then there's a this uh, phase turn. And if in in coherence in coherence mode. The, because the, um, if, if we uh, uh, superpose two, two wave fronts and then we calculate the, uh, the total intensity, then we, we got this, this expression and then we see there's a cross, cross uh, talking turn or interference turn over there. And because the, the phases are, are integrated, uh, so, sorry, the phases are uh, 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 synchronized. This two wave from the wheel uh, 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 move up and down uh, simultaneously, and then that will get generate the uh, the interference uh, phenomenon. Or put it another way, in coherence case, we have both magnitude and the phase information. On the other side, if the two two wave fronts are completely incoherent, then the cross the cross talking turn because the, the phase relationship is, is completely random. So if we do a time average, this turn will cancel out because at some at some point one is on the um uh, it's uh, reaching the maximum, for example, the other one can reach the minimum, then eventually they will cancel out. Then in the, the final result is the in in the incoherent denomination uh, 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 interaction mode, we uh, in the very end we what we get is the intensity summation of these two initial uh, waves, and then we lost all the phase information during this process. Okay, uh, now let's like, uh, briefly look at the, the very, very basic uh, concept for imaging with a lens. Mm, and here, let's consider a, a point source, mm, and then we can describe the, um, the uh, wavefront coming from this uh, point source as uh, as a, a, a complex function again. So here, this phi zero is the initial uh, uh, the magnitude of this point source. And then this phase, uh, phase turn is, uh, is, uh, represents the propagation property. And then you can see it also uh, is divided by R. That means because of light, all the light comes from a point source. As you can, as you can imagine, when the light is going out, if the light goes out in on the um, uh, spherical uh, surface, 
if if it's getting uh, further away, the um, the uh, surface on this uh, on this sphere is getting bigger and bigger. Then the um, the uh, amplitude on the the sphere needs to be uh, it's going to reduce. Or oh, in other words, when the light is cropping uh, further and further away, and then the um, the, the the intensity uh, along a certain direction will be reduced. Basically, that's what this term uh, describes. Okay, and then um, now we have light from a point source, and then the light will propagate uh, through a distance of z1, and then reach the um, the lens. This propagation through this z1 distance uh, can be described. Um, uh, by a quadratic phase turn into the to the propagation process, and then and then the light will interact with the uh, lens, and the lens we can describe the um, functionality of the lens using two aspects. The first aspect is the lens, of course, um, uh, has a finite finite size, or we can call it a pupil function. The the space outside this uh, lens area, the lens is not able to collect the signals in those areas. It's only uh, collect signal inside the pupil uh, function. Another uh, aspect is, as we all know, uh, for the, the lens, the thickness of the lens um, is uh, varying from the center to the lens and to the edge of the lens. And the, 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 lens, the profile of the lens is designed this way to introduce uh, another quadratic phase turn, which determines the focal length of this lens. So we can use this pupil function and this specific uh, quadratic phase turn to describe the interaction between the beam and the lens. And then after, after being passing through the lens, it will uh, pre propagate again to the image plane and then uh, let's assume the image plane is about Z2 away from the lens, and this propagation again will introduce another quadratic phase turn. So now we plug everything together, and then we're shuffling around a little bit, and then we found the uh, quadratic turn will, can, will, will turn to zero when the, uh, the Z1, Z2, and uh, um, the focal length of the lens satisfies the lens law. So if the, set, the lens law is satisfied, this turn goes to zero. And because everything is on the, on the shoulder of the explanation function, this turn goes to one. So eventually, what, what the turn left is, if we look carefully, is nothing but a Fourier transform of the pupil function. And because now, in this, in this case, our source is a point. So this, the, the image of a, of a point source is called the point spread function. And the image on the, um, the bottom right corner is one example of a point source. And you can see it has a, it's a, like, has a disc shaped center and has rings, concentric rings outside. And this, this kind of pattern is, is called an airy disc. And as, it, as you we can see here, so now our object is a point, or, or it's, the, it, it's the smallest object we can think about. But through this imaging system, we are not, we are not seeing a point. Instead, we're seeing this uh, airy disk. That means mm, the property of the, 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 the uh, imaging quality is, is determined by the, um, the quality of the lens or the by property of the lens. And this, in other, in other uh, uh, words, but this airy, airy pattern is the slowest, or, or the smallest, or the highest resolution can be possibly achieved by such an imaging system. Mm. Uh, of course, we can use the lens as a fo focusing device. Let's say we have uh, parallel illumination coming to the focus and coming, coming to the lens, and it lens focuses into a focal spot. The focus is, is not going to be a, a, a point with infinite size. Instead, you're going to get a air disk like this. So this is the, if you use the lens as a focusing device, this is the smallest focus you are going to get. Again, if you want to use this focus thing 
to scan your sample to do imaging, that is the size of this focus thing, or the size of this, this error disk will set the uh, resolution limitation of your imaging system. So as we can see, if we rely on lens for uh, visualization, the, the, the lens aperture and the, and the, the property of the lens really sets the, the resolution limit of the imaging system. To describe this effect, usually we use a concept called a numerical aperture to describe the uh, maximum, it, de it de describes the maximum um, angle this uh, lens can, um, can provide. And um, mm, a very, in, uh, a very uh, similar concept, F number is widely used in uh, lens making um, um, community. So next time, if you play with the, the cameras, if you look, take a look at the, the labels on the, um, on the lens head, you will find the, the F numbers like that. So then the relationship between the numerical, numerical aperture and the F number is F number equals one over two times the numerical aperture. Uh, okay, so now we understand if we use imaging system to look at the look at a point, point source, we get an array disk. So now let's say how we define the resolution. The, the one way is like, let's say now we have two point source instead of one. And then if these two point source are uh, far, farly separated, and then through the imaging system, we can see like two approaching um, uh, airy disks. And if, if the distance is sufficiently large enough, we can say, okay, now we, we, we know the, on the image, on the object plane, there are two dots instead of one dot. And then if these two dots are too close to each other, then eventually we get these two peaks uh, mer merge um, uh, together, and this case, at some point, we, can, we cannot really see tell whether there's one dot in the object plane or the two dots. And then, uh, um, uh, uh, to to really uh, define the criterion, Riley suggests like when the second array disk, the, the maximum point of the second array disk, sits on top of the first minimum ring of the first array disk. And then at this at this distance, this uh, uh, summation of these two uh, array disks will create a central dip with about 73.5 uh, uh, intensity of the uh, the maximum peak. And at this condition, because of this, uh, our and Riley claims our human eyes is able to. Uh, resolve this central dip and uh, tell, okay, now we are, there, are, there are two peaks there as well, and we can tell there are two dots in the, in the uh, uh, image plane. And that's the, using this to, we can set up the uh, resolution criterion of the uh, imaging system. And, and again, this, this uh, resolution limitation is, is heavily de uh, determined by the numerical aperture of the imaging system. So now let's uh, uh, let me give you an example of the impact of the um, uh, pupil function or the the numerical numerical aperture on the uh, obtained image quality. So let's start with the image uh, show on the uh, bottom left corner. That's our starting point, and then let's uh, impose a lens with a certain pupil function, and then with the um, quadratic phase turn representing the thickness variations. If we, uh, if we, uh, the lens uh, with a very, very small pupil function, and then we can see the, the corresponding point spread function is, is big. And then the obtained image is, is very blurry. And then if we gradually increase the size of the pupil function or the increase the size of the lens and increase the um, uh, numerical aperture, eventually, the, um, with the enlarged numerical aperture, the point spread function is shrinking and the image quality is improved. And so this simple uh, testing tells us in order to achieve a higher resolution, we, have, we really need to work with the uh, uh, imaging system with large numerical aperture. Okay, now let's say in order to, to create an image, we have to uh, 
uh, have contrast to see the, uh, the features you want to see. So in X-ray regime, the interact between the, the light and the uh, material can be described by the uh, reflective, reflective indexes. And the X-ray regime is a comp complex number, so one, minus, one, one minus theta minus pi theta. And then if we plug in this reflective index into the, uh, the wave function, we can um, break down this uh, uh, exponential turn into three uh, parts. The first part comes from this first one turn. That's just uh, free propagation in vacuum. And the second, second turn comes from this delta. And you can see, because it's uh, it's on it's uh, in on, on the shoulder of exp exponential function and it starts with i, so it represents a phase shift of the result, the final wavefront, and the third term is determined by the beta, and you can see this is a decay function that represents when the the uh, light passing through the material, the total intensity will decrease because some of the photons will be absorbed by the material. So in short. The, um, when an uh, X-ray passing through uh, material, two things will happen. One is the total intensity will reduce because of absorption, and then the, the phase will be shifted because um, the uh, length in the material is different in the vacuum. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, look at an example of these two uh, 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 effects. Let's look at the um, picture on the... Um, uh, top right corner first. So the blue curve is the um, the uh, uh, delta value for and, and which re related to the phase contrast. The yellow curve is uh, is the um, for beta value is related to the absorption contrast. <clears throat> and you can see in the X-ray energy regime, the the phase contrast usually is like. 10 times larger than the absorption contrast. And that's why in, in, for in X-ray imaging purpose, uh, usually, usually uh, phase contrast is preferred. So let's see, uh, let's look at the example. So here, the sample is a diatom. It's kind of, it's a biological sample, of, uh, mainly the, the, the shells, many, main element in the shell is uh, a silicon. And this measurement was done at uh, 10 keV. And uh, we can see if we look at the absorption contrast, we don't we, we don't really see any feature because the absorption contrast was so small in, in this uh, with this energy range. And, but in the, on the other hand, if we use the fish contrast, we can clearly see the 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 the, the, the delta and even see some uh, internal features of the sample. Um, another, another. If we look at the um, uh, plot on the top right corner again, we also see there like there are a few kinks on the absorption curve on the yellow curve, and this is called absorption edge. And as we can see, if we turn the the beta curve to the transmission uh, curve, we can see across the absorption edge, the um, transmission um, ratio will drop dramatically. And that's another uh, signature we can use to um, to identify the element types. And because the position of this element, the uh, absorption edge is elemental uh, specific. In this case, uh, let's look at the uh, fuel cell anode sample, which has uh, contains a nickel particles inside. And here, two uh, absorption contrast image images were obtained with a uh, uh, 16 EV uh, below the absorption edge and then 24 EV above the absorption edge. As we can see, when when uh, we uh, do the measurement above the absorption edge, the transmission will drop significantly. That's why here the um, we, the, um, the uh, nickel particle shows up as a dark uh, dark areas in the obtained image. So. By choose the but so if if you know what the uh, uh, element in your part in your target particle, you can choose X-ray uh, uh, accordingly to enhance the contrast of your target feature. Okay, and then um, let's say um, 
when we are above the absorption edge, the um, the instant photon will be very heavily uh, absorbed. Then, um, where does this absorbed photon go? And because the X-ray photons has relatively uh, higher energy, so it actually can trigger a series of phenomena. And in principle, if we are able to uh, measure the um, the um, output of each uh, uh, interaction process, uh, each uh, phenomenon can be used to create a, a contrast to form image. Mm. In this talk, we are going to focus on the fluorescence process and to create fluorescence images. And, and for fluorescence uh, emission, um, it's like um, when the, when the uh, atoms is illuminated by high energy X-rays, it will excite the um, electrons in the inner, inner orbital to higher um, uh, orbitals. And then after, uh, and, and then when uh, without X-ray, those uh, excited photon uh, electrons, they want to jump back to the uh, low energy orbital, um, orbitals. And then the, there's uh, energy difference between the high energy and the low energy orbitals. And this energy difference will uh, be emitted as a uh, fluorescence light. And again, the energy difference uh, between different orbitals, they are uh, uh, element specific. So each uh, element will give a, a, a very unique uh, fluorescence peaks. So this spectrum is a typical fluorescence spectrum from a uh, sample. As we can see, we, we can identify quite a lot of peaks on, in the spectrum and each peak we can associate to a certain element. And then you can imagine we can do this peak fitting for each pixel and then we plot the intensity for each element for for the entire for, the, for each pixel. Eventually, we can get a a series of images, and each one stands for the elemental distribution for for each element. That's a very powerful tool. Um, so here, <clears throat> because we need to ex uh, excite the uh, uh, electrons to create this fluorescence. Uh, signal, then we, we need to ask ourselves uh, what's the energy we need to use to, to, to uh, realize this excitement. So if we take a, look, a close look at this uh, table, um, the first column means uh, stands for the ex exciting energy for, for certain uh, edge, like for, if take gold for example, if you want to excite L edge, the energy needs to go 11.9 kV. That's the, the energy you needed to, to make the excitement happen. And then the second column and the third column, that's the, the emission X-ray energy. That means your instant being, uh, you shine the gold with 11.9 keV instant being, the outcome, um, uh, the, the generated fluorescent signal is, is, is lower. It's actually lower than the instant excitement, excitement being. And, um, and that tells us um, when in the in the real experiment, if you know what signal you are looking for, then you go to the table and find what's the excitement energy for that signal, and you need to tune your X-ray energy above at, uh, above this energy or above the excitement energy. Um, uh, you, you want to make the ex excitement emission rate. Um, uh, as high as possible, usually, you just need to turn your uh, uh, instant energy slightly above the excitement energy. But if the if you are uh, very f much larger than this energy, yes, you're still going to excite the fluorescent signal, but the exc excitation rate will be uh, will drop down a little bit. Okay, that's so. This is the second. Um, consideration uh, to choose the X-ray energy uh, for your experiment. Okay, so for uh, synchrotron and the synchrotron imaging and the microscopy techniques can be roughly uh, uh, classified in two, uh, two uh, uh, categories. The first one is uh, full field, including projection X-ray microscopy and uh, transmission X-ray microscopy. 
And this part, these techniques uh, were covered in Dr. Dr. Minyan Ge's lecture last week, maybe two weeks ago, yeah, in his, in his lecture. Another category is the scanning probe technique and also the uh, coherence based, uh, diffraction based techniques. And that's the, um, that's the um, topics we want to, we're going to cover in this lecture. Um, okay, uh, since the um, X-ray imaging is heavily uh, uh, depends on the um, X-ray optics, let's spend a little time to, uh, to uh, discuss the types of X-ray optics. Mm. So for the, the general purpose of X-ray optics can be considered like we have a light from a source and we want to either create an image or we want to focus it to, to a image plane. And then I, um, one consideration is like we can put the source and the image dot the points on the, um, on the two foci of a elliptical um, function. And then the X-ray lenses can is arranged according to the uh, elliptical um, profile, and depends on different the geometries, physical um, phenomena, or different geometries of the lenses. The, the X-ray lenses can be classified in three uh, groups. The first group is the reflective lens. Another one is uh, reflective, and then the other one is diffractive. Okay, probably we are most familiar with the reflective lenses because in visible light region, we use a convex lens to focus the visible light. And this is because in visible light region, the reflective, reflective indexes of the lens material like the uh, glass or plastics, they are larger than one. So uh, when the uh, reflective index is larger than one, we use a convex. Uh, lens to focus the beam. And the, the principle is the same for X-ray regime, we can use the, the same idea to focus X-rays. Um, the, the, the difference is in X-ray regime, the reflective, reflective index is, is uh, smaller than one. So instead of using a convex lens to focus, we use a, a concave lens to focus X-ray. Uh, and the um, uh, reflection index in X-ray regime is only a tiny bit smaller than one. This is like 10, typically it's 10 to minus five. It's very, very, very uh, close to one. So that means the, um, each concave lens only bends the X-ray, focus X-ray a tiny bit. So in order to create a focus, we have two choices. We either chain a long list of the concave lenses, each one bends the X-ray a little bit, a little bit, and then this bending accumulates, and in the very end, we can create a focus. Or we make we, we generate a, a gigantic single lens with very large, very small uh, curvature. And then it also can be able to create a focus. The first type is called a compound refractive lens, or CRL. The second type is called kinophone lens. Okay, the second uh, type of X-ray lens is reflective lenses. So basically they are, they are mirrors. Mm -hmm. Again, depends on the geometry, they are two types. The first type is if we assume the light is coming from a point source, and then we want to focus it to, to another point. Then the, uh, this type of lens should have a elli elliptical um, profile and the source and the, the focus are located on the two foci of this uh, foci of this um, elliptical function. And in a second case, the light can be considered as a parallel illumination. The beam comes in parallelly, and then we want to focus the parallel beam to um, to a focus. In this case, the uh, the mirror surface has a pro parabolic uh, profile and uh, the focus point will be located at the focus spot of the uh, par parabolic function. At some, at some point, these two geometry, um, they merge together. We can assume if the uh, point source, the source is very, very far away, and then 
when the light uh, come uh, instant on the on the mirror, they can be considered home pretty much uh, as considered as uh, parallel being. So and if at, at that condition, this two the profile of these two types of mirrors, they are very very similar to each other. Uh, the third type is diffractive lens, lenses. Mm, the most widely used one is called a Fromel foam plate. So basically, it has a, a ton of opaque and transparent uh, rings. And the idea is they only allow the light passing through the lens. They um, the, um, add up uh, constructively to create a point source at the focal plane. And, um, and so the, in order to create a small focus, the, um, uh, we, we need to create very fine zones and that's determined by the zone width of the structure. This is the, the cross section of the zone plate. And in order to make sure uh, we can focus as many uh, photons as possible into the focus, we need to increase the thickness of the such zones. And um, so ideally for, 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 for ideal zone, zone plate, we want to have very, very narrow zones, but very, very tall zones. So you can imagine it's like you want to build a wall, very, very thin, but very, very tall. So techni technically it's, it's quite challenging because they can be easily like pull down. So another type of uh, diffractive lens is like, we try to avoid the technical difficulty to fabricate this thin and, and the tall zones. So instead of fabricating this vertical standing structure, we turn everything 90 degree. We uh, deposit alternating opaque and transparent layers on the silicon substrate. And in this case, the thickness of each layer can be precisely controlled to be very, very uh, thin. And then <clears throat> in the very end, because we have a huge uh, multi-layer structure and we can crop whatever thickness you want to, to um, create the final lens. So using this approach, we can achieve very, very fine zones and we can make the zones as thick as, as you want. And the, uh, the downside is this kind of structure because it's, it's flat, it's, uh, it's a 1D focusing device. We need to cross a pair to create a point for focus. So right now at, at uh, our facility, we were able to use this type of X-ray optics to focus X-ray down to 12 nanometers. And uh, we can routinely Focus achieve this small uh, focus beam, and uh, now it's available for general users experiments. Uh, okay, now please allow me to introduce the imaging and the microscopy program at NSS2. Mm, we are one of the five programs around the ring. Mm, we in this program we have a few scanning probe beam lines with the probe size varying from uh, a few microns at S, uh, X, F, M to like submicron at S, R, X and down to uh, 12 nanometer that at uh, H, X, N. We also have a full field imaging beam line here. And uh, uh, two weeks ago, Dr. Ge, in his lecture, he, he uh, captured the uh, capability can be done at that beam line. And we have a black coherent diffraction image beam line currently on the construction. And we also have another um, tender X-ray spec spectroscopy and uh, um, imaging beam line. And the probe size also like a few microns. And uh, we can see this group of beam lines provides uh, a group of um, uh, visualization and analytic tools covering a rather large range of resolution and the field of view. And the uh, HXMB9 I'm going to talk about today uh, locates at the high resolution and the relatively small field of view region in this, in this uh, map. Okay, so this is a schematic of the HXMB9. Uh, the main purpose is focus X-ray for a tiny spot 
and then scan the sample across the focus beam. And at each scan position, we try to collect as many signals as we can. So currently, we can uh, run three detectors simultaneously. There's a fluorescent detector, which captures the fluorescent spectrum. And we have a, a pixel area detector captures the transmitted uh, scattering pattern. And if the sample has crystal structure, we have a, a second mm, pixel area detector to capture the black diffraction in the signal. Mm. And I think this layout is a good example to show the variety of X-ray lenses and the variety and the, the filters to create a, a, a coherent source. So let's look up closely. So here, this is the uh, a horizontal collimating mirror, and this is a horizontal prefocus mirror. They are mirrors, so they are reflective lenses. And then we use a reflective. Uh, Com uh, compound reflective lenses, CRL, for our vertical prefocus. And this is a reflect refractive lens. And then in the final stage, we use either zone plate or multi-layer Lowry lens to generate the nano fox beam. And this is uh, the diffractive lens. And in order to create such a small focus, we have to use coherent beam. And in this beam line, we use a mono monochromator to pick up a specific X-ray energy or a specific wavelength. And so this is this monochromator functions like a temporal coherence filter, which only allows a single uh, color passing through. And then we have a, a, a secondary source aperture, which which is a small pinhole which uh, selects the specially coherent light and it functions like a special coherent uh, filter. So we have both filters into the beam line and which can select a uh, coherent beam for the final um, illumination. Um, in order to accommodate as many sample systems as we can, we actually build two microscope modules in our, in our chamber. The first one uh, use stone plate as the focusing optics. So uh, this setup can focus X-ray down to about 30 nanometer, and it provides a generous walking distance, usually about uh, larger than 10 millimeter. And this stone plate module usually works at a relatively low energy range, below 12 keV. The other module use multi-layer Lowry lens for focusing optics. This optics it's able to focus X-ray down to 12 nanometer, but it only gives us half millimeter walking distance. Um, so the, for, for samples use, using this in, uh, instrument have to be carefully tailored to fit in this tight space. And especially for uh, like tomography, diffraction or in situ experiments, we really need to be very, very careful on designing the sample. Uh, sample system. And for the multi-layer Lowry lens setup, typically uh, we uh, work with a higher energy range, about 10 keV. Okay, here is a quick example of the, cap the, the imaging capability with such a small beam. So the sample is uh, it's a self-assembled super lattice structure. The each, each white dot in this SCN image it's a, it's a gold sphere with about 15 nanometer diameter, and they are spaced by uh, 50 nanometer. And as because our beam is 12 nanometer, it's smaller than the the size of the gold sphere. In the in our scanning probe measurement, we from the the fluorescence mode, we can directly see the the gold dots. And that's another indication our beam is is uh, quite small. And uh, if we use uh, the transmitted signal to reconstruct image, we can get a first contrast image of the gold balls with even higher resolution. Uh, okay, so uh, this movie um, gives us a rough idea run experiment with all three detectors uh, collecting data simultaneously. The image on the uh, top left corner, that's the, mm, 
uh, uh, ROI summation on the certain fluorescence peak. And that gives us uh, 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 roughly gives us uh, uh, the element distribution for the for the for the peak. And the second picture on the left column that's the transmitted scattering pattern at each scan point. And if we uh, integrate the total scattering intensity for each scan point, we get an absorption contrast image. And if we look carefully, you can see the the scattering pattern is kind of jitters in x and the y directions uh, at a different location of the sample. And if we analyze how much this pattern jitters in x and the y direction, we can obtain a differential phase contrast image from using the transmitted signal. And the third picture on the left column, that's the bright diffraction um, pattern from, from at each scan position. And again, if we integrate the total diffraction intensity for each scan point points, we can uh, generate a diffraction contrast image. Of course, we can further do this uh, spectrum feeding to get a quantitative elemental maps for each individual uh, element. And using the uh, transmitted scattering signal, we can use um, either Dif uh, di differential phase contrast or typography reconstruction algorithm to generate a phase contrast image. And by tracking where the, where the uh, black peaks moves from point to point, we can generate a few maps representing the, the lattice defect of the crystal. And we can see all these images can be obtained simultaneously from one single scan. And we refer this technique as multimodal imaging. Um, here, I'll give you a quick example what we can do with this multimodal imaging technique. Um, here, I use a widely used uh, lithium battery, lithium iron battery material as an example. This is uh, a lithium cobalt uh, oxide. Uh, sorry, let me let me close my card. The light is shining. Um, Shining my face. Okay, now it's much better. Uh, okay, the system is lithium cobalt oxide, and this is a widely used sample system because it has a very long list of good properties. But in the same time, it also ha has some downside. Uh, for example, the practical cap capacity is much worse, much um, worse compared with the theoretical prediction and the performance decays rapidly after cycling. And there are a lot of studies uh, to uh, figure out what's the problem. And uh, one of the reasons is that when these particles are charged up to 4.5 volt, it triggers a phase transition. And this phase transition uh, initiates uh, internal strain and uh, this strain can be accumulated, accumulated through the uh, uh, char charging process and which, which eventually will create cracks and uh, deform the, the particle. And it also triggers some um, harmful um, reactions to, to reduce the functionality of the whole system. So in order to solve this issue, there are a lot of uh, methods were proposed and working with our user facility, we uh, uh, explored two methods to, for, for solving this issue. The first method is to, to, to create a core shear structure with, uh, with a magnet rich uh, uh, shear to uh, improve the stability and with a nickel rich core to provide a high en uh, energy density. And uh, this, um, and then the build, uh, the, the concentration for each element is gradually changed, gra gradually changing from the core to the shell to to mitigate the lattice mismatch and uh, difference in volume change. That's the first system we started. The second system is to dope the target LCO system with multiple dopants, and each dopant plays a, a different role in the new system and they work together to enhance the performance of the, uh, the, 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 the particle. And 
So in our multi multimodal imaging technique, our fluorescence channel is, is able to provide the element elemental distributions of this distance. And uh, the uh, face contrast imaging uh, mode can provide a high resolution, special, uh, special uh, uh, visualization capability to see the initialization and the propagation of the cracks and all other morphological changes during the, the uh, charging process. And our uh, black diffraction channel is sensitive to the internal strength. So uh, our multimodal imaging system is, is very good to study this type of sample systems. Um, so the target system, cautial, system with cautious structure, it's like they are they are um, a bunch. They, they are a bunch of uh, primary particles, and they aggregate together to form a secondary particle. And on SEM, the secondary particle looks like a, a rice ball. And um, we started with two uh, D uh, imaging on such uh, secondary particles. And from the fluorescence channel, we can clearly see this core shear structure. And if we look at the the line line cut, we can clearly see, even clearly see the concentration gradient from between the shear and the core. And, and uh, using the transmitted scattering signal, we get a very good face contrast images from DPC or tachography. And here we start to see the each individual primary particles and uh, get a rough idea how they aggregate together to form this secondary particle. And in order to get a statistical uh, idea on um, the property of, of the, the, the quality of the particles, we did um, a 2D mosaic scan covering a relatively large area and uh, image a uh, uh, lot of uh, particles simultaneously. Again, this is the um, overlaid fluorescence images. We can see the very nice the core, core shear structures. And uh, we can uh, collect the fluorescence signal from uh, standard um, reference samples. And then we use that signal, we can convert the fluorescence map into uh, elemental percentage maps. And then if we look at the overall statistics, we can see the the overall ratio between nickel, manganese, and the cobalt is about 811. And that's what <clears throat> we expected from how the sample the particles are synthesized. And again, if we take the line plot, we can see the peaks for the for the shell, the plateaus for the score, and the slopes uh, for the um, uh, um, the uh, concentration gradient area. So after we succeed in 2D imaging, we move forward to 3D imaging. To do that, we need to collect 2D images at each projection angle, and then we rotate the sample and collect the 2D images again. Then we need to um, align the collected uh, projection series, and then we give we uh, fit the um, aligned projections into 3D reconstruction engine to get a 3D reconstructed image. So we did the measurement uh, from uh, the core shear particles. Uh, we did uh, we measured one pristine sample and one cycle sample, and those are the obtained um, fluorescence contrast images. And uh, now we can see very uh, clearly the core shear structure in both cases. And if we take a closer look on the elemental distribution, we can see for the pristine sample, the overall ratio of these three elements is about six to two. And for the uh, cycle sample, it changed slightly to like seven to one. And if we look at the the um, uh, central line plot, we can see the the um, the ratio as the the shell almost kept the same to like five four one, and in the center it changed a little bit from seven one two to seventy fifteen fifteen.
and since the core shell structure preserved quite well after charging, this is a good indication of the about the um, stability of this sample system. And we uh, <clears throat> during uh, the fluorescence data collection uh, process, we collected uh, transmitted far field diffraction pattern, and use that we can get a high quality uh, face contrast image using tachography, and those are the obtained images. So now we have, since we have enhanced resolution, now we can clearly see each single primary particles and see how the aggregate is together. We can see the cracks and uh, the voice inside the secondary particle. And with this high quality image, we can do like a segmentation and to figure out what's the percentage of voice in, in uh, each particle. And then we found for this uh, uh, core shell structure with concentration gradient, the void percentage actually almost kept the same after cycling. And this is another indication um, about the uh, stability of this sample system. And uh, in the same for comparison, we did uh, the same measurement on uh, um, uh, regular sample with, with no core shell structure. And we found the void percentage there increased significantly after cycling. Um, okay, so next we <clears throat> looked at the second approach to solve the problem. It's like co-doping -do co uh, three elements into the target LCO particle. We, uh, we uh, started with uh, 3D imaging on, um, on the uh, secondary particle first. And here we found the fluorescent, the, the, from the fluorescent channel, the cobalt and the aluminum almost uniformly distributed inside the particle, it's blended into the, the uh, native LCO lattice. And if we look at the titanium distribution, it is quite interesting, it's like, it covers the, the surface of the particle and it forms a interconnected network around the boundary of the primary particles. And this, this network like <clears throat> improves, improves the uh, conductivity between uh, primary particles and it modifies the surface property of the entire particle, which enhances the um, overall Electro, uh, electro chem chemical electro uh, uh, performance. And so next, we focus on uh, a single single um, primary particle of such a system. And this is SEM and we collected a 3D fluorescence uh, image of the particle first. This shows a, a nice, nice crystal with well-defined classes. And then, um, if I take a close look at the, titan the, the titanium distribution, again, we found the titanium distribute, distributed on the surface of the, concentrate on the surface of the particle, which um, agrees with the observation from the secondary particle uh, measurement. And then in order to uh, study what's the impact of the, uh, the lattice structure through doping, we uh, did a nanodiffraction measurement with this particle. And in this case, we, um, we uh, placed the, the uh, detector to catch the 101 diffraction peak from this crystal. And then we rocked the crystal over two degree range. And then at each, each uh, rocking angle, we collected a 2D scan. And mm, this is the... Uh, diffraction contrast movie of the measurement and each frame is the diffraction contrast image at each rocking angle. And we can see there are quite a lot of features in that inside this little crystal. And since we have this uh, rocking curve measurement, we can, um, we can like at each scan position, we can go through the rocking curve and find which rocking angle gives the maximum diffraction intensity. And because during the measurement, the sample was rocked along the y-axis. So if we plot, if we plot the um, uh, rocking angle gives a maximum intensity for each pixel, we can obtain a map represents how the 
crystal is twisted along the y-axis. And then after we find the, uh, at, each, at each scan position, well, after we find the where the black peak is, then we can decompose the position of the black peak into two, uh, along two directions. One is along the powder ring direction, another one is perpendicular to the powder ring direction. And the motion along the powder ring detection means the, uh, the crystal is rotating along the Z axis. In this case, the Z axis is pointing out from the screen and the to, 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 to us. So the motion on the powder ring is the crystal is rotating in this direction. And the, the motion of perpendicular to the powder ring because the, 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 the location of the powder ring is determined by the the, uh, determined by the two theta, which is determined by the d spacing of the lattice. So if it moves in this direction, it means the d spacing of the crystal is changing from point to point. So using these two components, we can get um, get maps. One map representing how the crystal is bended along the z axis and how the d spacing changes uh, different points. And we compare the result from a, a bare LCO and a coded, a doped LCO. We found the doping actually introduced quite a lot of uh, defects into the particle. But interestingly, the, mm, the chemical electro uh, measurement shows the dope, doped system has uh, improved uh, uh, performance. And uh, the powder diffraction measurement also shows the <clears throat> through doping, the pre-introduced strains actually suppresses the unwanted phase transition at the uh, high charging states. And this evidence kind of uh, suggests the um, strain engineering can be a, a new approach to enhance the uh, performance of this um, uh, lithium iron battery materials. And okay, and now if we take a close look of the projection view of the contrast, diffraction contrast images we get, we can see roughly see two types of um, uh, defects. One is the big chunk of domains in both cases, and also another type is we can see this this warm shape uh, curve inside the crystal. And there's another work using black CDI technique. They they uh, resolved the three D distribution of the edge defects uh, inside a similar crystal. Okay. Here we can see the edge defects they form this like curved loops inside the crystal, and uh, which is consistent from what we see here. And of course, in, in our case, we see a, a, a projection of these curves. And but we're very happy to find the consistency from other measurements. And uh, recently, we commissioned um, the nano Zems technique. I believe in Dr. Ge's uh, lecture, he covered how the Zems mechanism works. So in our case, we uh, scan, we do a fluorescent scan on the sample, and then we we'll change the instant X-ray uh, energy a little bit and repeat the scan. And then we repeat this scan by changing instant energy um, many times to to uh, cover the one of the absorption edge for a certain element. And then we can apply the Zen's feeding techniques to, uh, to, uh, re to get the um, uh, um, chemical states for the target element. And, and this method will give you not only the chemical sensitivity, but the uh, uh, um, ox oxidization state uh, sensitivity. Uh, okay, I think uh, we'll make a break over here. Mm. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, type in, in into the Q&A section and uh, we'll come back in roughly 15 minutes. Is that right, Sal? Uh, you wanna take a 15 minute break or a 10 minute break? No, let's, let's do 10 minutes then. All right, 10 minutes. All right, so um, we'll be back at 10.22 uh, New York time or 22 minutes after the hour at your local time. Okay. And uh, okay. once again, um, if you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A and we will try to answer them after the break. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, uh, Dr. Huang, uh, as of now, there are no questions in the Q&A. So we could start whenever you're ready. Okay, mm, I'll keep moving them. Uh, by the way, um, uh, I think I'll, I'll share the slides to sell. At some point, you make, you're going to get it. And my contact information is on the, the title slide. And if you uh, ask now, and then we can discuss. <clears throat> Okay, let's keep going. So, uh, so far we talked about imaging techniques uh, uh, use, uh, based, based on lens. Essentially, we use lens to create the image or we use lens to focus the X-ray to a spot and uh, use it as a probe and scan across the sample to create an image. So, as we mentioned in, in, in best method, the uh, Achievable resolution is heavily determined by the property of the lens. Essentially, it's a numerical aperture of the lens. So, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, um, we because the the lens imposes a limitation on the resolution, and uh, and the idea is okay. If we want to achieve even higher resolution, can we take the lens out? Can we like remove the limitation imposed by the lens and collect the scattering pattern directly. And because we know the relationship between the four field diffraction pattern to the object, it's a, it's a Fourier transform. And we know how to do Fourier transform with help of computers. So in principle, we can get rid of the, the lens and do directly collect the diffraction signal and the, reconstruct the, the real space image again. By doing this, we remove the, the limitation imposed by the physical lens. And this type of technique is called uh, coherent diffraction imaging technique or lensless imaging technique. And, um, uh, but this, of course, nothing is, is free. So in this case, um, uh, the, as we know, the Fourier transform of a complex function, we are, we are, it's, all, it's also a complex function. Essentially, it has magnitude and the phase. But in experiment, our detectors is only able to cap to, to record the, the magnitude information or the phases, phase information is lost. But unfortunately, in this process, the phase information is very critical. Um, I'll give you a quick example. Let's start it with the uh, image of the Brookhaven logo. And then if we do a, a free transform to a free space, we're going to have the uh, amplitude part and the phase part. So now, if we only take the amplitude part and do a do a inverse Fourier transform, we get a real space image, but we don't really recognize any feature similar to the logo. Instead, if we use we take only the phase part of the Fourier transform and apply an inverse Fourier transform to only phase, we in the in open image we can pretty much see clearly the, the, the letters of the logo. And this, this example tells us the face information is very, very important for this imaging process. However, but unfortunately, unfortunately, the face information is lost during the uh, measurement. So now the, question, the next question is, can we calculate the lost information back? And first of all, to, in order to do that, we need to make sure the the, the problem is uh, is not ear posed. It mathematically is, is doable. So let's consider we have a detector with uh, n and uh, with n uh, columns and uh, m rows. So in total, we have m times m um, pixels. And at each pixel, as we mentioned, because it's a complex function, it has magnitude and the phase. So at each pixel, we have two variables. So in total, we have two times n times m uh, 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 unknown variables. That's what we want to figure out. But in detection, we only detect the magnitude. So, so the number of known variables is n times m, but the, the number of unknown variables is two times n times n. So, <clears throat> so if we, just go like that, the problem is e opposed and mathematically it's impossible to reconstruct the face back. So 
we need to apply certain constraints. So for example, we want to reduce the number of functional variables. If we simply uh, constrain the size of the object, and that means we we only image uh, object with with um, a finite size, and the size of the object is smaller than fifty percent of the entire field of view. In this case, we can reduce the number of unknown uh, variables by at least half fifty percent. Then the num to to match the number of known variables to make the problem at least mathematically solvable. And this is the constraint in the real space. <clears throat> and the, the if this uh, sampling condition is satisfied in real space, and then in, in Fourier space, the speckles will, uh, uh, means each speckle will be occupied by at least two uh, pixels <clears throat> during the detection. So once this sampling condition is satisfied, this problem in principle is solvable. This is a typical uh, algorithm to uh, for this phase retrieval uh, uh, process. So we started with the measured uh, for, uh, amplitude in the Fourier space. And at the beginning, we sign a random phase to this uh, magnitude. And then we apply a inverse Fourier transform to real space, and we get an image like that. And since we know the object only uh, exist in a confined area, then we we uh, we can uh, you apply this uh, constraint and set the pixels outside this area to zero to reduce the mm, the size of the object, and then we Fourier transform the modified image to Fourier space again. And now we have both amplitude and the phase. And here we uh, replaced amplitude with the measurement and they keep the uh, phase. And then we pre transform the uh, real, real space again and then it trace. And then if the data quality is good enough, it will give you a, a space, space uh, a real space image. And uh, this technique was firstly demonstrated in 1999. In this case, they collected the diffraction pattern like this, and then they were able to reconstruct the image which agrees with the SCN observation very well. And uh, so in, in this technique, because we, we don't use the small lens between the sample and the detector, we the, the resolution is heavily depend, uh, uh, dependent on the, the signal, what kind of signal we can collect on the detector. And uh, as we, we, we know, um, the, 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 uh, the scattering, the power of the scattering signal decays dramatically when we moving far away from the diffraction center. And this depends on what model you are using. This scattering signal typically decays with the third or the fourth power of the Q. So here, this three images is a, a quick uh, example. With 50 millisecond dwell time, maybe we can collect the signal with sufficiently high signal to noise ratio at to uh, up to about 14 nanometers features. And if we increase the explore time 10 times to 0.5 seconds, we can uh, collect a higher Q signals. Maybe now we were able to resolve, in principle, to resolve 10, seven nanometer features. If we keep incre increasing the explore time, then we can increase the re uh, achievable resolution down to three nanometer. So, so the, the take home message is in order to achieve a higher resolution, you need to put much more dose to your sample. And then <clears throat> consequently, the next question comes up is the relationship between resolution and radiation damage. As we know, if you put too much radiation dose to your sample, eventually your sample will be damaged by the by X rays. So here is an example for biological samples. The um, this this trunk the, the curve this uh, area covered by the blue uh, marked by blue represents the to reach certain resolution what the radiation dose is required. As we see, in order to reach, uh, resolve final and the final 
find out the final features, we need to put more and more edition those. And then the area in, uh, labeled by the light blue, that represents at which dose, at a, at, a, at a certain dose level, what kind of feature was destroyed. So as you can see, when you put it, uh, sorry, when you're putting more and more dose in the sample, fine and the fine features will be de destroyed. And if we follow these two trends, eventually they will meet at around 10 nanometer. That means you need, when, when you are, when you are um, uh, put more dose on the sample beyond this limitation, even, even though your, your target is to uh, resolve features smaller than 10 nanometer, but those features unfortunately are already been destroyed. So this is kind of just a detection limitation for the, for the biological system using X-rays. <clears throat> and of course, these days, there are, there are numerous new ideas coming out to break down this limitation. And that's, the, that's where the, uh, the fourth generation synchrotron source, the free electron lasers, uh, can make an impact. So the, in the uh, free electron laser case, they can pack a huge amount of photons in a very short pulse. The pulse can be as short as like femtosecond uh, 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 length scale. As we know, when we say the, the sample is damaged, what we really mean means the X-ray uh, breaks down the chemical bonds between the atoms in the material, and then turns the atoms to, uh, to like freeze at the atoms so they can move around, they can move away from each other. Eventually, the the, the structure, initial first structure, is is uh, damaged. But we know each physical motion that requires time. So although the X-ray can break the bond instantly, but the two atoms, it takes the two atoms some time to move apart from each other. And the idea is, if we, we make the, uh, the uh, laser pulse sh uh, short enough that the, um, it is shorter than the time required for the atoms to move. So it's, in principle, we can collect the, the structure information before the atoms moves. So although the chemical bonds destroyed by the item still doesn't have enough time to move around, so we still capture the, the information in, uh, as in the initial stage. Then by doing that, we can go beyond the limitation to achieve a high resolution. And of course, after measurement, the sample will be damaged, but we collect the information before the damage happens. Okay, <clears throat> so now, as we as mentioned, the, this diffraction-based measurement uh, the technique is able to achieve uh, high resolution imposed by the lens. So this is the highest resolution has ever been demonstrated using this technique. So in this case, the sample is a silver cube, and they put tons of illumination on this sample. They, the total uh, exposures, like half hour for this 2D image, and they were able to, and of course, this is a silver metal cube, and it's it's, it's very tough. It's radiation tolerant. Uh, it's re uh, radiation hard. It can take a lot of radiation codes. And in, in this case, they were able to reconstruct the cube and uh, cross the cross the edge to achieve two nanometer resolution. That's the highest resolution has been uh, reported. And of course, we can. Uh, uh, apply it with the tomography uh, concept, rotate the sample, take a 2D image, and then uh, assemble them together to a 3D image, or we assemble the um, diffraction pattern at each uh, angle together to form a 3D diffraction volume, and then perform the 3D reconstruction simultaneously. In either method, we can able to get a high quality 3D uh, images. And, now, if your sample uh, has crystal structure, um, uh, besides we have the scattering pattern in the transmission direction, we also have identical crops at the black peaks locations. And in this case, we have another choice. We can place detector to capture one of the black peaks, and then we rock the sample. Mm, and in this case, we don't. We, we only need to rock the sample like 
one or two degree range to covering the entire 3D uh, data volume, uh, which is uh, it's, it's quite a big uh, benef benefit compared with transmission measurement because in transmission mode, we need to rotate the sample like at least plus minus 90 degree to, to make a full circle to like to get a decent 3D reconstruction. But if we use the black diffraction, we only need to rock the sample like one or two degree to collect the, three, the entire 3D data volume. And this <clears throat> gives you a rough idea how the data collection was realized. So in this case, we use a cube as our sample crystal, and this is the ECB. And during the measurement, and this is a detector plane. And uh, during the measurement that we rock the sample, the instrument being a detector doesn't change. When we rock the sample, as we can see, the diffraction pattern slides through the, the, the detector, slides uh, plane by plane. So by doing this, at each angle, we collect one slice of the 3D diffraction pattern, and then at the very end, we can assemble them together to get a 3D diffraction volume. And then we use the same reconstruction algorithm, we can get a real space image, which has both amplitude and the phase information. In this case, the amplitude part gives you the shape of the crystal and the electron density of the, the, the crystal. And the phase information, so in this case, is different from the um, transmission case. This, in this case, the phase is determined by the, the uh, lattice. Uh, displacement project to the um, the black peak uh, direction. So this is able to give you the component of the displacement field. And um, so here is, is an example of the black CI measurement on uh, this in ion battery crystal. And they, they uh, did the, they keep measuring the same crystal during the charging process and they found uh, um, during the charging, there are uh, edge defects uh, uh, was initiated, and they they um, they uh, formed uh, the loops inside the crystal. Mm. Okay, so so for this uh, for this uh, coherent the diffraction based imaging techniques, the good side is it ha it breaks down the limitation uh, the resolution limitation imposed by physical lenses, but uh, as we mentioned, in order to make the uh, phase retrieval problem solvable, we need to constrain the size of the object. So, so but in a lot of cases, our sample is either we need to want to cover a large sample area, or the sample uh, is inside a certain uh, environmental area. So we cannot really get an isolated sample. So what do we do here? So now, this, uh, a, a good approach is to combine the diffraction-based imaging technique with scanning probe technique. As we know, the scanning probe, because it, 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 the sample is scanned across the beam, so essentially you can image whatever uh, an area as large as you want. You just scan your sample to an extended object. <clears throat> as we show here, we you scan uh, you use a relatively small beam scan over your sample and then you get a enlarged field of view. But the, the, the downside is again the of, of, um, achievable resolution is determined by the the beam or determined by the numerical aperture of the uh, optical system to create this focus beam. So the, it will if we only use the scanning probe technique, the uh, resolution will be limited. So now how how do we combine? The diffraction based method with the scanning technique. The, um, the solution is called uh, tachography. So, in this way, we use um, a beam and then we scan the beam across the uh, sample with extended uh, um, air, uh, field of view. And then in, at each scan position, we collect the far field diffraction pattern. And in this case, the scan follows a, a specific. Uh, spiral. Uh, we are going to talk about this uh, traje uh, trajectory later. But the in terms of data uh, collection is very similar to what we see in the in a, a conventional scanning probe measurement. We scan the sample across the focus beam and then collect the diffraction pattern at each point. But 
in order to uh, make sure that all three works, the difference is the two adjacent scan positions needs to be heavily uh, over overlapped like this. And <clears throat> because in this case, we have a probe function and we have optics function. We, what we are measuring actually is the Fourier transfer intensity of the product of the probe and the optic function. And uh, as we can see, uh, in this overlapped area, like in this uh, area uh, uh, labeled by red, the features in this area, this in the, the structure information is encoded in all these three diffraction patterns. So when we use this diffraction pattern to reconstruct the real space image, the features in this overlapped area has to be consistent. So this provides a very strong constraint we can use to, uh, to, to realize this real space reconstruction. And we can define cost function in a different way. And then we can update the probe function and the object function simultaneously use this uh, overlapping constraint. And this movie shows how the reconstruction works. We start with a, a random guess of the sample and we use a disk as a starting point of the illumination. As you can see, the reconstruction engine is able to uh, find the true solution in, in like within like 30 iterations. And in this case, you can see because the probe function is completely decoupled from the object function. So in this case, <clears throat> we can resolve a resolution much smaller than the probe size. Basically, it's similar to the CDI case. In this case, the, uh, we can reach the diffraction limited resolution. It's only uh, it's, uh, determined by how how um, how far we can detect the the high Q signals on the detector. Okay. So now let's talk about uh, how we should how, how we should scan the the, the sample. So uh, intuitively, if we do a scanning probe measurement, we we scan uh, on we do a raster raster scans on the mesh grid, and that's how we generate a two D image using a scanning scanning probe. And but soon we realize if we we do the typography measurement using this mesh grid the reconstructed image, we see these periodic uh, artifacts. And this is because in typography, we, what we are really measuring is the product of the probe function and the object function is the, pro the product of these two. So we can imagine if, we, if the probe function uh, multiply with the arbitrary uh, function f, and if the object function divides by this arbitrary function, eventually the product will keep the same. And if this Optary function has the same periodicity of the scanning mesh, then the algorithm cannot tell the difference. So this optary uh, period, periodic uh, function will exist in the reconstructed image. That's what we see is a periodic uh, artifact. So to solve this problem, a concentric scan pattern was proposed to break down the symmetry and now because the signature doesn't exist, this, uh, we can effectively eliminate this uh, artifact term. So now with this scan pattern without uh, symmetry, we can uh, uh, get a decent reconstruction without the artifact. Then the question is, can we further optimize this trajectory? And we did a like, literature re review, review and we looked around from the, and we actually found some hints from nature of, nature uh, creators. So let's look at uh, the pattern from formed by a pine, pine cone, artichoke, sunflower, and uh, the leaves on the uh, pine label. We will find actually those structures were uh, organized in a very specific way, like the spiral kind of spiral type of pattern. And actually this kind of pattern is related to the Fibonacci numbers. This number is uh, start with zero and a one, and then the next number is the summation of the previous two numbers. And if we mm, assemble the, we create a series of squares using the Fibonacci number as the as edge and stack them together, we can create a very nice uh, spiral. Mm. And actually this spiral is 
uh, exist in the natural world. If you look at the cross section of uh, Nautilus, it's exactly following uh, this uh, spiral. And if we take a close look at the patterns in the in the in those uh, creatures, we found, for example, this sun, sun, sunflower flourish is created by a series of these uh, spirals. Con uh, Counter, uh, clockwise and the counterclockwise uh, spirals, the inter intersections defines the, the location of the forest. And in this case, the pattern, if we, we, we can count, there are like 13 clockwise spirals and 21 counterclockwise spirals. And if we go back to the Fibonacci number series, we find 13 and 21 actually are two consecutive um, Fibonacci numbers. And in order to create such a pattern, Actually, we can use a very elegant equation, very simple equation to two equations to create such pattern. And here, this one of the equation involves a golden angle. And this angle is so magical, it, 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 uh, it separates a full circle, 360 degree into two parts. And the ratio between these two parts is the golden ratio. And this angle is also referred to as a golden angle. And we, if we use this pattern uh, as a scan trajectory, we again, we can get a very good image without artifacts. And we did a test with X-ray measurement and we found when the overlapping condition is very generous, both the, the spiral from format spiral pattern and the, the concentric pattern, they give very good reconstruction qualities. And when the overlapping condition is poor, and then we found that the format spiral pattern indeed gives a better reconstruction quality. Um, okay, and, and because the, as we mentioned, the more motivation for this technique is like combine the, the beauty of diffraction-based imaging technique to provide high, high uh, resolution and the beauty from the um, scanning probe uh, technique to uh, to uh, image uh, area with very it was enlarged field of view. So here is an example to achieve very high resolution over a large field of view. And this is the sample is a integrated circuit, <clears throat> and they did a high resolution image over a large area. We can keep zoom in and uh, give you very fine features. And of course. This uh, technique can be applied to, uh, in 3D. In this case, they imaged a uh, 300 times 304 micron area. And in their final scans, they achieved 19 nanometer 3D resolution. And uh, yeah, so basically this technique combines the uh, advantages of scanning probe and the diffraction technique. Uh, again, the same technique can be applied to uh, crystals. Um, so in this case, uh, we measured a uh, uh, zinc oxide tetrapod. So it has four legs, three touching the substrate and there's one uh, 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 standing up leg. We measured the standing up leg. Mm. And then we, we, the instant X-ray being shines at a different location of the standing uh, rod. And we, we rock the sample and we collect 3D diffusion data. And then we move the sample to a different location and uh, repeat the measurement and collect the 3D diffusion data and do it again. And then using all the, the diffusion patterns recorded at different locations and use the tachography reconstruction engine, we were able to reconstruct a elongated rod. And amplitude tells us, gives us the size, the dimension, and uh, uh, um, the um, electron density of the, the rod. And then the phase again determines the, the um, uh, displacement field projected to this Q location, uh, projected to the Q direction. And at HXMD9, working with our user group, and we we uh, apply the same technique to uh, to uh, uh, Indian uh, Garnian uh, arsenic nanowire. In this case, this is the, how the wire looks like on the ACM. And uh, in this measurement, we did two working measurements at two practices. 
One is sensitive to the um, uh, stacking defect along the wild direction. Another one is sensitive to the in-plane strains. And in both cases, we were able to reconstruct the 3D volume with, and the face gives the uh, defects information. Um, okay, now let's change gear a little bit and look at the imaging system itself. And <clears throat> as we uh, keep emphasize that in order to, to achieve a high resolution, we have to work with um, imaging system with large numerical aperture. But the physics, the larger numerical aperture, the depth of field will shrink. Like in this case, in this case, this is with larger numerical aperture, we, we can only see one object. If we reduce the size of the, uh, the, the aperture, we were able to ex extend the depth of field and we can see different objects and different depths. So this, Competed two competing effects, the resolution and depth of field, makes it very challenging to sometimes impossible to achieve high resolution image from a sick sample. And for scanning probe measurement, the very similar phenomenon, uh, phenomenon will be found. That uh, like in order to create a small focus, we have to use a optics with large numerical aperture, but in the same time, the depth of field is shrinking. So again, <clears throat> it's very challenging to obtain high resolution image from a sick sample. Um, before we uh, go forward, uh, I want to mention there's a subtle difference between uh, depth of focus and depth of field. Um, for, especially for the um, uh, diffraction-based the imaging techniques, because here we want to in, in, enhance the resolution by using the diffraction signals in the high Q area, which is beyond the, the um, uh, di well, beyond the central cone diverged from the, uh, the focus, uh, optics. So this system has a even larger uh, effective numerical aperture beyond the beyond the numerical aperture defined by the uh, op uh, focusing op. op so as a result, the, <clears throat> the resulting uh, depth of field is even smaller than the depth of focus. So that's another penalty we need to pay when we are really aiming for high resolution image. So <clears throat> because our beam line is dedicated, it's design, was designed to, to do high resolution image. So the, we, uh, the question we ask ourselves is like, can we extend the depth of field, but without sacrificing resolution. And because we still want to achieve high resolution, so we need to want to work with optics with high new mega aperture. And with that, we explore two methods to extend the depth of field. One is the multi-slice technology. In this technique, we can reconstruct multiple uh, slices at different depths simultaneously on the sample. The second technique is called a focal stacking. In this method, conventionally, you translate your sample along the z-axis, and as it e, and each uh, translation position, you take a 2D image with different features in focus. And in the very end, you you ex extract the foc the uh, in focus features from each uh, uh, snapshot and combine them, combine them together to form a 2D image with extended depth of field. And uh, in our approach, we uh, uh, improve this method mm, and we don't need to translate, physically translate the sample along the z-axis. Uh, let's look at the first approach. Uh, first, uh, it's uh, multi-slice typography. So in this method, uh, we adapt the multi-slice uh, concept developed in uh, electron microscopy community. So in this method, uh, we decompose a thick material into a series of, of thin uh, slices. And each slice is thin enough that, um, and then to, to the thin enough to uh, satisfy projection approximation. And then um, the interaction between the illumination and the sample can be modeled slice by slice. 
and the wavefront is freely propagates uh, is uh, uh, freely propagating from one plane to the next plane. And we can imagine in the very end, the exit wave uh, from the sample carries all the depth information, and this information can be used to reconstruct the uh, each slices at different depths in the sample. And this idea was firstly demonstrated with visible light, and it was soon adapted in X-ray regime. And we use our nanofocusing optics uh, multi-layer low lens to perform this uh, multi-slice experiment. Uh, we built a sample uh, uh, with two layers uh, separated by 10 micron, and uh, uh, the, the focusing optics used in this measurement uh, has a depth of focus about four nanometer. So the depth of the, the target depth of field is far beyond the depth of focus of the uh, imaging system. And we collect data with 50 millisecond draw time per point, and we were able to reconstruct two planes separated by 10 micron, and each plane we achieve a resolution about like eight nanometer. And so this is, uh, we clearly, we uh, extend using the multi-slice takeoff technique, we extend the achievable deep depth of field well beyond the depth of focus of the uh, optical system using this uh, set. And we can find some those features like here representing the the shape and the size of the, the particle and they show on the wrong plane and, and this is because those those features represent low spatial fre frequency signal and this low spatial frequency signal they don't propagate much during the they, they don't change much during the propagation process so the reconstruction engine cannot tell the difference between two planes and cannot separate. And fortunately, in our multi-modal uh, imaging technique, we collect fluorescent signals simultaneously uh, during the measurement. And in this specific sample system, because the element types are different on different layers, so the obtained fluorescence signal can provide uh, the low spatial frequency uh, signals <coughs> of the of the layers, and this low spatial low spatial frequency information provided from the fluorescent channel can be used to to decouple the cross talking low spatial low spatial frequency features, and we uh, apply this idea to uh, even <coughs> challenging um, uh, sample system. In here, the two layers is only separated by 500 nanometer. So in this case, we use the signals coming from the uh, fluorescent channel and we can su successfully reconstruct it planes separated by only half a micron. And in this case, in order to, um, in order to increase the depth the sensitivity, we have to uh, uh, enlarge the numerical aperture of the imaging system to do that. You can see we increased the exposure time by a hundred times. To really collect collect the high Q signal to enlarge the numerical aperture of the imaging system and to improve the depth sensitivity. Okay, <clears throat> a second approach we use to extend the depth of focus is called focus stacking, and this method uh, was explored in both electron and X-ray uh, microscopy communities already. The main idea is mm, we uh, translate the sample along the, the beam propagation uh, direction. And at each translation uh, position, we take a snapshot. And then the, the features at different depths will show up uh, sharply at different uh, 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 snapshots. And in the very end, we find a way to ex extract the in, in focus features from each snapshot and combine them together to form an image with all features sharply presented, essentially ex ex extending the depth of field. And this method has been proved to work very nicely in both 
uh, X-ray and X-ray and uh, electron microscopy systems. And uh, uh, only one downside is, of course, you some you have to repeat the measurement many times by translating the sample along the Z direction. And using the uh, tagography method, we found hmm, the, this method actually can do uh, the stacking in uh, numerically. We don't need to physically translate the sample. So to uh, il to il illustrate this idea, we did a simulation. Uh, I simulate two flower pictures and separate them by a distance. And then I illuminate them using a focus beam. The focus beam is the, the, pro the profile of the being changed from plane to plane. And then I simulate one data set. And then if in the reconstruction process, if I use the beam profile on the first plane for reconstruction, like we can see in the obtained image, the first, uh, the flowers on the first the flower on the first plane is sharply reconstructed. And if I use the same data set and use the wavefront on the second plane for reconstruction, and you can see in the obtained image, the flower on the second plane is sharply reconstructed. And this simulation tells us that in the tachography reconstruction process, the, uh, the wavefront profile actually determines which reconstruction you are you are you are uh, performing so and uh, this phenomenon can be clearly seen with the experimental data set so in this case the the gold particles and this nickel oxide particles they are separated by they're, they're sitting on uh, the front and the back side of a 10 10 uh, micron thick membrane and Using the same data set, if we tune the probe uh, uh, function, and uh, we, we see, like, if we use the um, wave front on the front surface for reconstruction, we can see the obtained image in the, in the ob obtained image, the gold particles on the front surface is sharply reconstructed, and the nickel oxide particles on the back surface is blurry. And then we can take this probe function and propagate uh, 10 microns to the back plane and use that function for reconstruction. And now we can see in the obtained image, the nickel oxide particle on the real plane is sharply reconstructed. And in the same time, the gold particle from on the front plane is blurry. And this is exactly what we expected. In, we use exactly the same data set by tuning the, uh, uh, the, the, the probe function, we can select which plane we, we, are, we are running the reconstruction. Okay, in order to extend the depth of focus, the next step is how we uh, uh, pick up the in-focus features from this numerical uh, stacking series. Um, pick up the focus, um, all the focus features and assemble them together to form an image with all features uh, sharply presented. And to do that, we, uh, we uh, follow the recipe developed in previous works to use a uh, wavelet transform. So <clears throat> here, this is an example to, uh, of the wavelet transform result from, uh, from this uh, uh, slide. Mm. The beauty of the wavelet transform is that it does is not only tell you like the brighter, the brighter the the, the wavelet transform result means the the, the feature is 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 sharper. So the, the the sharper the feature is, the brighter the um, wavelet transform signal is, and also it tells you where it tells you exactly where this sharp sig signal is located. So this method is perfectly. Uh, suited for this uh, um, uh, um, uh, need, like we want to uh, extract the, uh, the shock features from a specific location. So we can apply this <coughs> wavelet transform to all the frames in this numerical numer numerical uh, uh, stacking pro uh, process. So we can get a stack of this wavelet transform uh, frames, and then, <clears throat> and on each pixel, 
we can go through this stack and uh, pick up the pixel pick up the uh, the maximum pixel value. So we do this uh, uh, picking selection uh, process for all the pixels, and each pixel goes through the stack, pick up the maximum uh, pixel value, and then we can form a single uh, frame with each pixel has the maximum pixel uh, value, and then we apply a inverse leverage transform to the obtained uh, um, slide. Then we can uh, convert back to a real space to form an uh, image with uh, all features sharply presented. <clears throat> mm, okay, so, mm, so now we present two techniques, multi-slice technique, multi slice typography and uh, um, uh, a focal stacking technique, which can extend the depth of focus and without losing information. Okay, so now <clears throat> let's look at the, the pictures we showed up at the very beginning of the talk and ask the same question again. Um, how to define a good image for visualization purpose? And now hopefully, uh, I have shown to you guys that the, this two pair of images is like the, the two pictures on the left side, they can be considered to be taken with a numerical system with a large numerical aperture, which gives you a high resolution, but it, it has a shallow depth of focus. And the pictures on the right side can be considered was taken with an uh, imaging system with relatively small numerical aperture, which has limited spatial resolution, but it has elongated um, uh, depth of field. So, so it's not about good or bad. Uh, it's like really depends on what you're really looking for. If you want high resolution and you don't care uh, depth of resolution, uh, depth field uh, uh, too much. So for example, if you can, Seeming your sample to a very thin slab, then you can choose to use a uh, imaging system with a large mega aperture. <clears throat> and if you do care, if you do want to image thick materials and you you are willing to sacrifice the achievable resolution a little bit, then you can choose to use a system, imaging system with relatively smaller mega aperture. <clears throat> and of course, uh, in some cases you don't you don't want to make such a compromise. You want achieve high resolution, and you won't have uh, extended depth of field simultaneously, then we present you two methods to do that, either multi-slice typography or uh, focal stacking method. Using either technique, you can have both uh, uh, benefits, be benefits simultaneously. Uh, okay, to, uh, to summarize, mm, so, um, we show the basic principles to use, use X-ray to for visualization, and uh, the, because X-ray has very uh, powerful penetration capability, so we can use X-ray to uh, study thick materials. And because X-ray has a rel relatively short wavelength, so it's possible to use X-ray to achieve high resolution. And because X-ray photons have uh, has a relatively high resolution, so it can uh, um, trigger uh, a different uh, reactions within the sample. And each uh, reaction, um, the product from each uh, reaction can be used for imaging, so which uh, makes multimodal imaging um, uh, possible. And uh, in terms of uh, X-ray imaging and uh, and the microscopy, <clears throat> they are, we went through the we mentioned the several uh, groups of techniques. The first two groups is about full field imaging. One is um, uh, you collect the transmission contrast image and you rotate the sample, then you can get a three D uh, image from the sample. And you can, of course, you can uh, scan the energy, the instant energy of instant beam, and uh, collect the, the absorption contrast images at each instant energy. You can do perform the zinc type at uh, imaging technique to to give you the um, uh, chemical state information. And these these techniques was covered in a doctor uh, lecture like two weeks ago. 
And in this talk, we mentioned about, we focus on the scanning probe techniques. The first uh, uh, method is like at each scan position, we can collect the uh, uh, emitted uh, fluorescence spectrum. And from that, we can get the um, uh, uh, individual elemental maps uh, in the sample. And of course, we can uh, locate the sample and collect the same, same information and the different projections. And we can uh, assemble everything together to get a 3D reconstruction um, of, uh, with uh, a fluorescence uh, contrast. And <clears throat> we can also um, uh, uh, scan the instant X-ray energy and um, um, perform the similar uh, dense type uh, uh, data analysis to get uh, uh, a chemical uh, the, uh, observation state sensitivity of the, of the sample. And we can uh, <clears throat> collect the, the uh, scattering signal from the sample and uh, using uh, differential phase contrast or tachography reconstruction algorithm to, pro to, to provide a phase contrast image with high resolution. And of course, we can, again, we can rotate the sample and collect 3D data set and uh, give you a 3D, uh, 3D uh, 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 reconstruction with high resolution. And if the sample has critical structure, we can uh, orient the detector to catch a certain um, black uh, diffraction signal and then lock the sample uh, around the uh, vicinity of the black peak, collect 3D diffraction pattern, and then we can. Um, reconstruct the image and uh, provide information uh, about uh, uh, the lattice defects inside the crystal. And, and um, uh, um, so, so here at NSS2, we, um, we provide this suite of uh, tools for, um, for um, uh, realization purpose. And uh, we hope, uh, uh, one of them or a few of them, we are is able to provide uh, the useful information to uh, for your for your uh, study, and uh, we are eager to have you to come come to us and we we collaborate and work on specific projects together with our tools. And with that, uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm I'm open to 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 them. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yes, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them in the uh, Q&A. Uh, we'll wait a minute or two and then uh, we'll figure it out. Um, I have a random question. When you're mm -hmm. going through the uh, golden ratio type thing, are, are yeah. you saying you're actually scanning in a spiral or? Yes, yes. Oh, that's cool. Okay. So essentially, so this is, this is a, a scanning technique, right? So basically you collect data point by point. So now, so now instead of scan the, following the mesh or the concentric points, you, we follow this uh, format spiral. You go point to point using this pattern. Wow, I didn't know that. And that actually gives you a better resolution, I guess? Yes. The, yes, the, the, the through experiment that we confirm this, this pattern gives you a, a better image quality. And the reason behind it, so if we, if we, uh, so the, the, the basically why, why there's so many such patterns existing in nature, and there's a reason behind it. For example, for the leaves, the, the leaves on the, the pineapple, they're organizing this uh, shape. The reason is if you do the math, you, work, you go through the mathematical mm, property of this pattern, you will find out this pattern gives each leaf the equal uh, opportunity to re receive sunshine, sunlight. So this is the most efficient way to arrange the leaves in, in the space to give each, each, each leaf re receive uh, the same sunlight. And for the, sun, for the flowers, the, the, the florets was, <clears throat> if you arrange the florets in this pattern, it gives each floret the equal opportunity to be exposed to the bees or butterflies to, to um, transform the pollens. So 
that's that's really that's the uh, mathematical principle behind it because this pattern especially is uh, especially optimized to give each point equal opportunity to expose then wow. that means that, yeah in scan each scan each each point is equally uh, overlapped that, that, and that's the reason why it's it's the best cool uh there is a question in the ch in the Q&A yeah uh, how long does it take on average to complete uh, the different scans Oh, okay. Um, so um, let's see. Let's go back to here. <clears throat> this is an example. Uh, so as I mentioned, for the diffraction base, uh, as I break down, break this question to two folds. The first one is if we uh, only use the uh, if only care the fluorescence signal, right? The fluorescence signal then means. Um, uh, we need to get sufficiently high signal to noise ratio from the fluorescent channel, as it, and and it's clearly the signal you is is directly proportional to the dwell time. So let's say mm, you, we can use certain uh, criterion, like for example uh, the Rose criterion, like twenty five counts. Uh, if if the signal is about twenty five counts, we consider it has a, 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 a significantly high. Um, Signal to noise ratio is usable. Then we tune the tune the experimental time to to make sure it gives you that signal above the ratio. And for diffraction technique, we need to make sure the diffraction uh, signal is uh, it goes far enough to for the target for the target resolution. Uh, like in this case. We need to tune the expert time. If you targeting seven nanometer resolution, so we have to use 0.5 seconds of low time, for example. Um, so, but typically at our D9, um, uh, we try to f to uh, finish a 2D scan within like from 10 minutes to like half an hour for each 2D scan. And you can imagine for 3D measurement, we need to take like maybe uh, like at least 60 or sometimes 80 or 100. 180 uh, frames. So it's like if we, each frame is like 20 minutes, and if we do 90 frames, that's how many? That's like like uh, uh, 30 hours. Yeah, as you can see, it's very long. So um, basically, the the scanning probe technique is on. It's a slow imaging technique because each point is. We need to scan point by point. It's not like the full field image technique. You you take a snapshot and you get it to the image. So so here we certainly we are a slow technique, but the beauty is we have multi uh, contrast mode. We can do multi modal multi mode imaging, and we were able to, we have the opportunity to to give you a, a image with uh, with higher spatial resolution. All right. Um, I think that was the last question on the Q and A. Uh, if you have any more questions, uh, we'll give you another minute. So let's just wait a minute, and then uh, we'll just call it a day. All right, uh, it looks like uh, there's no more questions. So I would like to uh, thank Dr. Juan. And then uh, we're gonna call it a day. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Thank you very much.